Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Photocon Hawaii Virtual. Uh, good morning to all of you. Um, yesterday was a fantastic day. We had great workshops. Today we have six waiting for you, six dynamic speakers waiting. Tomorrow, six more speakers. Fantastic. Please know that you can register for any of the workshops if you haven't already done so. Just go to photoconhawaii.com, register in, and you'll be on your way. Today, we have a good friend and somebody who's been to Hawaii before, Steve Richard. Steve is a phenomenal photographer. What you'll find out about him as you go see his work is how methodical he is in his light placement and his imagery. He got, does classic, classic images. I think you're really going to enjoy him. So thanks to phase one, bringing Steve Richard in with us. Let me introduce you to Steve today. Hello, Steve. Wherever you are, Steve. This is very good. This is where I can do a little ad libbing. So, can you bring a friend in to visit us? Hello, Steve. Nice to see you, buddy. It's nice to be seen. And sorry for the little uh, glitch in trying to get my camera to turn back on here. Hey, but, no, no uh, yeah, problem. I'm no back. problem. Yeah. Hey, you know, we're in Hawaii and it's all easy. Um, Steve. Wait, you were here about two years ago, right? Uh, I wasn't. There, I think it was the very first one, Rick. Was it 2017? Uh, yeah, 17 it was. Wow, it yeah. just feels like a recently. Yeah. yeah, I know we all really enjoyed your talks, and it was nice to have you in person. But this is fab fabulous to have you here with us well, today. I'm, I'm thrilled. In fact, as you notice, I'm I'm wearing my authentic Hawaiian shirt to uh, I see celebrate. That. And you, yes, and you look very good, and we like that. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, yeah, you, you don't uh, have to lie, Rick. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I don't. <laughs> you know, I, one of the things I just want to tell our audience is that uh, we do have that chat on the right hand side we're really happy and and we encourage you to ask steve any kind of questions um we'll help him to monitor your questions so if he doesn't answer it right away he'll come to it um we'd like to be do, do it a nice workflow so i think with that i'll just leave it to steve and see we look forward to hearing from you once again thank you so much for being with us thanks rick appreciate it very much thank you well, and hello everyone. I'm thrilled uh, that you're here and I'm thrilled to be here. And, and a big thank you to Rick uh, for putting this on and his team because, thank you. wow. So, so it's funny, I'll call this uh, presentation and I'm gonna see if I can uh, bring up just the title because it's, uh, yeah, I, I call this presentation One Step Beyond Batshit Crazy. And it's funny because when I first sent it to Rick, Rick said, oh, I, I really want that. And we had this argument because I said, well, no, not really. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's mine and you can't have it. And of course, I'm just joking. But Rick is one of the people who I think is truly batshit crazy. And, and it's just amazing that he was able to uh, put his team together and still bring this event even under these strange times. And I'm so thrilled to be a part of it. And um, so a big thanks to Rick, a big thanks to phase one, but a huge thanks to everybody who's taken the time to, uh, to log in and, and join me for this presentation. So I'm gonna start with a, a tiny bit of information about myself. Um, so I've been, I've been in photography for a long time, actually since the, the early 70s, uh, which, which number one makes me old. It makes me probably even older than Rick, and I think that's probably hard for most of you to believe because if anybody who's seen Rick, but yes, I think I am even older than Rick. And, and it's, it's been this wonderful journey for me to be in, involved with photography for such a long time. And I'm, I'm at what I call the end of career portion of my photography day. So this is, this is, um, this is basically, I've done every type of photography you can imagine, you know, from portraits to kindergartens to commercial to, to working in color labs. And, and uh, you know, I've actually even fallen out of love uh, with photography a couple of times. But it wasn't until about 15 or 20 years ago that I decided that I was only going to do photography um, on my own terms from now on. So, and and I've in in you know since then have stretched right out that now I actually even really refer to myself more of an artist than I do a photographer. And and I thought this is this is going to be a really interesting way to see if I can. Uh, bring a new perspective to photography by just talking about uh, looking at it from the perspective of an artist. And in, in my case, um, I, I really only do fine art photography and more specifically, I only work with the human form. So I only work with human bodies. I love to, uh, to tell stories and create 
moments um, with with the human body. And as you see from this presentation, I, I probably do push the batshit crazy fringe a little bit um, with with how I approach my work. But uh, you know, one of the things that I'll I'll probably talk about again is I, I don't do any post production. So other than maybe remove the odd blemish. Um, and, the, and the touch of dodge and burning, but I'm I'm totally a no post production type of photographer. So for me, I do everything in camera, and and it takes me sometimes a very long time to create an image. And th that's the, but that's not really what I want to talk about today. What I really want to talk about today is really looking at photography from a different perspective. Looking at photography from from really as as if you were an artist and. And this is a, you know, this can this can be um, really uh, confusing at points. But I, I think what's really important is that there's there's really a lot of commonality. There's there's a they're not mutually exclusive. Photographers and artists aren't mutually exclusive. But there's there's some different points of view that that are really unique to an artist. And and I think for me, what I wanted to do was was to start off this presentation, and and talk about these differences and i think that's going to be really interesting for everybody um and then i'm going to i'm going to talk a little more specific about my work and i even have a little video to show uh not too long from now that that really gives you it you know behind the scenes uh, look at how i do things and by the way i'm 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 a photographer that doesn't leave the studio so you, you know i don't go outside i don't like it when it's cold i don't like it when it's hot i don't like getting wet I don't like it when I'm too dry. I don't like bugs. I really like to live in a very controlled studio, and that's that's where I pretty well spent my career, and I totally spend on or plan on spending the rest of it indoors. So, um, so I think that's a big caveat. Um, all the images you see, everything I do is really done in the studio. So let me talk about some of the big differences that I have found over the years um, when when I'm looking at. Uh, photography from the perspective of an artist and and the first one I think is really important and this is something if anybody's ever heard me present before then you know this isn't a new slide but I really think to look at photography from the perspective of an artist you have to take this vow of poverty and I mean it in in both literally and I mean it not literally of course so the, the real point is that I think as an artist, you have to create work that is totally about you and for you. And I think that's really important. And in, in my images, I, I don't do any per spec artwork. And for, you know, everything I create is a story that I want to tell, is an image I want to create. And I solely do it for me. And uh, I'm lucky because I've been doing you know, really focusing only on, on fine art photography for, uh, you know, a long time now. And, and finally, you know, I'm actually able to sell my work, but I don't create work to sell. I create work that's important to me. And if it sells, that's fine. So this, this vow of poverty, I think is really important. And, and I don't suggest any young photographers do this right off the bat because it's, it's, it's not a very good road to take this vow of poverty early on in your career. But what I do think is important is that everybody, no matter where they are in their career or their journey as a photographer, really should have a portion of their work that's personal. They should do some portion, whether it's one image a month or one image every year or one image a week that is for them and about them and nobody else, just for them. And not even worry about that it would ever sell, just don't worry about it at all, do it exactly what we would like to do. And, and I think so, I think that's really important. And the next thing I'm going to talk about is probably the most important thing. And, and it's a simple word, and it's called intent. And, and I've made some observations uh, over, over the years that's really reinforced this. But the first time this word really popped into my head was when I was in, in London, and I, the, my favorite gallery in London is called the Tate Britain. And in the Tate Britain, there's this room that has a lot of the pre paintings, but there's this one painting uh, that you can see on your screen. It's called Hope, and it's by George Frederick Watts. And I remember the first time I seen this painting, which, by the way, is one of my favorite in the world. Um, it just it it just brought me to tears. I just thought, what an incredibly beautiful piece of work. But the thing that popped into my head that was almost one of these da moments was that 
every every single thing about this painting the artist intended to do every brush stroke every choice of color shape shadow form every single thing the artist chose there was intent and what really surprised me was i just thought you know it's interesting that many many of us as photographers don't put very much intent into how we create work and it's not that that's a good or bad thing and by the way i really want to stress that i'm not trying to point out that um, looking at the photographer's perspective of an artist or looking at photography from the perspective of a photographer, that either one is right or wrong. It, it, right or wrong. It really has to be, you know, what's important to you. But for me, I thought it was really interesting that artists, you know, create work that is full of intent. And a lot of photographers that I know, and myself included way back, um, did, didn't put very much intent in, in their work. You know, we let the camera choose what's in focus, let the camera choose exposure, um, you know, let um, just the frame didn't really matter, you know, like there was just so many things that, that I, you know, that we didn't choose. And, and now, of course, and I choose everything. In fact, when I create an image, there's very little that, that I haven't made a choice on. So intent is a really, really big, Big thing that's important um, and then this next discussion I think is really interesting and this is what I call uh, the priority that people take when they create work when they create their images and um, I'm really lucky I get to travel or I used to get to travel around the world now I sit in my office and talk to my monitor but um, but I used to get to travel around the world and talk to uh, just large numbers of photographers and we'd get together over coffee, we'd be at events, and, and I'd have these wonderful discussions. But I always found it interesting that when I was speaking with artists, groups of artists, it was a much different conversation than it was when I was speaking to groups of photographers. And one of the big differences was in what was important or the pr priorities when you're creating images. And, and I always found this very interesting. So for me, for example, um, when when photographers create work one of the questions i'm i'm usually asked all the time is well what what camera do you use what what software do you use what lens did you use for this shot what was the you know what was the exposure what was and i always found that really interesting and then we you know people ask about subject and and why, why do you choose this subject and blah 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 and then the next thing is now and then someone will say, well, what, what were you thinking about? What are you trying to say? But that's very rare. And I find this so interesting that, especially starting out, most photographers are really interested in the technology and the craft. And, and, and that seems to be the most important thing. And don't get me wrong, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with this flow, this, this uh, priority list. But, but I think what's interesting is that artists don't, don't really use this list. They, they turn this totally upside down. And from the perspective of an artist, the most important thing about your art is you. It's about what you want to say. It's about your involvement with creating this piece of art. And then the next important thing is, is subject. That's, you know, that's really important to an artist, but it's not more important than themselves. And I think that's really interesting. And then the third thing, and by the way, this is usually when I, if there's, because phase, phase one uh, is sponsoring me in this event, and I, and I would ask that if there's anybody in phase one uh, to, to uh, this is a really good time to go and get a coffee. And, uh, okay, if, are they, have they left the room? Good. Because the third thing and the most least important thing is the technology. Um, the technology is just so unimportant. So yeah, I find it really interesting, and I'm uh, I'm really hypocritical because I actually do use Phase One cameras, but the the none of that's really important at all. The, the camera equipment you use, the lens you use, is just not important compared to the other two. And so I think that's really important for me to stress that. Uh, Phase can go back in the room now if they want. That's fine. Okay, good. Um, so I think this is really really interesting to look at the differences between photography and art is, is, are these two priorities. And the, and the next thing I think is really fun and interesting is the way, um, the way photographers measure uh, their, their work compared to the way artists measure their work. So, and, and I get into so much trouble every time I'm asked to judge 
uh, a photography contest. And by the way, Rick actually asked me to pick, you know, an, an image uh, for this one. So I hope I don't get into trouble. But, uh, but I find it really interesting every time I sit down with a group of photographers and we're talking about what makes good photography. Um, we get into some really heated discussions, and and I think um, it's really important uh, for me to say there's a huge difference in the way photographers look at what makes a good image compared to the way an artist looks at a good image. And so I usually I usually joke. In fact, if I was doing a presentation, I would make this slide come up in a bullet form. But but it's it's I used to get into so many uh, arguments with people that say, well, no, we need to assign you need to assign kind of weight on on what makes a good image. You know, is uh, the compositional rules followed, and 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 then of course now then in the last ten years, it's, there's a lot of people who think that the number of Facebook likes mean something, and I'm not sure what that means, but it means nothing to me. Um, so, or, you know, how many how many Instagram followers you have, as if this is a real measure of what is a good image, but I, I'm not sure. And then we, I, I, joke, I joke about this magic formula, because if you apply this magic formula to every one of your images, it'll mean nothing as well, because it really has no merit. And And I could go on and on and on with the way that um, photographers in general measure how good an image is. How sharp is it? You know, is it does it does it follow the, you know con certain conventions? Um, I I've even had you know people talk to them and say, well, you know, the backlight should be one and a half stops greater than the front light, and I just think, why? None of this makes any sense to me. And if you look at the way an artist would measure an image, I think it's much different and much more important. And from an artist's perspective, I think you only need to ask two questions. And that is, what is it that you want to say? And how do you want the viewer to feel? That's it. That's the only two questions. And if the answer to these questions um, mean that you've succeeded, if you, if you want to say something and your image says it, and you want your audience to feel something and, and they do feel it, then wow, that's an incredible image. Nothing else matters. It doesn't matter whether the image followed any rules or has any likes or it has any magical formulas. None of that makes any difference to me. It's not important at all. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean you shouldn't follow compositional rules and, and you shouldn't understand how to do really good craft. And I think I can't overstate this enough because I'm not, I'm not saying, oh, forget all the rules and just go out and tell your story. There, you know, I have seen in incredible um, incredible stories, uh, incredible ideas fail miserably because the photographer or the artist didn't have the craft, didn't have the skill to, to push that story or that moment or that idea anywhere. And, and I think that's really important. But I can tell you some of the most banal images I've ever seen have followed all the perfect compositional rules and are absolutely pixel sharp and and are perfectly balanced and they're the most nothing images and and i just think wow this is two ends of you know the extreme so i think it's really important that yes uh, for me the story is everything how your audience feels when they look at an image is everything but if you don't have the craft and the skill to get there then well then you're going to have a really difficult time getting your story to to scratch the surface so i think it's really important um, I have a I have a mantra that that I say, and if anybody's um, if anybody's ever seen um, me present before, they'll 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 recognize this because I say it every time. In fact, and anybody who has ever assisted for me, I think they nearly throw up every time I say this because I, I I mention it fifteen hundred times a day. But but this is something that I follow and and I use all the time, and and it's for me it's what makes a great image, and it's. And it's really, I think, if, if you take anything from today, this would be a really wonderful thing to take. But, but for me, it's, it's easy to create an image of a beautiful thing. What's really difficult is creating a beautiful image and replace beautiful with powerful or exceptional or anything you would like. But it, most people will go out and document beautiful, powerful uh, subjects. And I find it really interesting how that comes back when they say, well, was, isn't this a beautiful image? And, and I, you know, for example, I, I can't remember, it was, it was not that long ago when someone said, oh, look at this, this beautiful portrait 
of this girl. And I thought, well, no, I see a portrait of a beautiful girl, but it's far from a beautiful portrait. And, and I think understanding this difference is really important. And for me, this is a measure I, I apply to every single image I create. And, 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 I, and it's, it's just such, uh, it's been such a rock for me over the years to use, excuse me, to use this mantra in everything I do. And, and this kind of leads on to the next thing, which I, which I think is really um, gets me into trouble all the time. In fact, it, it got me into trouble with, with, uh, with another photographer that was presenting in Photocon in 2017. Not real trouble. We joked about it, but, but I'll, I'll tell the story in a second. And, and it's the way um, photographers create images and the intent in the way of the images. So I think as photographers, we can use two approaches uh, with our work. We can document things and events. And I mean this in the most positive way you can imagine. We can document events and things, um, and it takes a lot of skill, it takes a lot of craft, and it takes a lot of energy um, that uh, to do this well. And, and for example, um, I'm not really that good at events because I'm just way too slow. And, uh, and, but photography, even when photography started, this is really what it was about. It was about capturing things and representing things. And, and I think that's really important. And if I put that at one, one end of the scale, sorry, one end of the scale, and if on the other end of the scale, I say, but we can also as photographers tell stories. So we have documenting events and telling stories. And, and somewhere in between is where most of us live. But I think the artist spends a lot more time on the telling stories part. And, and when I say telling stories, uh, it's kind of like telling stories, but cinematographers get to tell stories. Cinematographers have 24 frames a second, um, and, or 30 frames if you're shooting video, but 24 frames a second and many seconds to tell the story. As photographers, we only get to create one image. So we have a moment. So for me, photographers really just create moments. So you, you have this choice as a photographer to document things and events, and, and that's really, really important. And, and that is a classical part of photography. But you can also start to move over to telling stories. And I think that's really important when you want to start looking at things from the perspective of an artist. And, and for me, it's always about story. And, and that's kind of when I start to talk about, did you just create an image uh, of a, did you just document a beautiful thing or did you create a beautiful image? And, and I think that's a really good measure. Um, the story I tell, and, and Rick, Rick will know, and I forget, I forget his last name is Stephen, and he's a really good photographer. He uh, presented with me in 2017 at Photocon, and, and, uh, and he, I remember he watched me talk about this, and he came up to me after and says, oh, so I just document things, though. And I said, well, not really. You, you actually create beautiful moments, um, and maybe you just don't know it, but he, he did a lot of kind of documentary-style photography. But he chose everything really well. Everything had intent, and and he even whether something was blurry and ugly. But in a way, he was documenting things. But he was really from his perspective and telling his story through this these uh, these subjects. And I thought that's that's really you know even though I might have offhandedly you know pushed him far over to one side, he really wasn't. He was really a very brilliant photographer that was doing more art than maybe he thought he did. So um, I, I thought, you know, it was an interesting discussion that we had, you know, over, over a drink later, but uh, it, was, it was quite interesting. So um, I think that I really think is important um, is to create not just moments, but to create moments that aren't, uh, aren't maybe so obvious in a way, but if, but if you can create a moment or if you can create art that allows the viewer to project their own story and experiences, that's really exceptional. In fact, it's the most exceptional thing ever. When I can go look at a piece of art and it brings up memories and it brings up emotions that are really personal, that's an exceptional piece of art. And for me, that's, that's what I spend my days trying to do is I try to create these moments that push someone down I rode a little ways, but I don't, I, I have one of my dogmas other than no 
you know, Photoshop or post-production is that I don't want to hit anybody over the head. I really think it's important to create work that's, um, that's really, um, that really allows the viewer to, to uh, push their own experiences on top. And I think for me, that's, that's what I spend as much time as possible doing if I can. It's always kind of been my my philosophy and my uh, my uh, my goal is to create images that allow the viewer to uh, to look at it in a different light. Um, so this is I, I think what's really interesting is you've got artists and you've got photographers and there's there's obviously this common ground. They're not mutually exclusive. They're somewhere in, in the middle. And I think this middle approach is really. Um, ironically enough, just your approach and your point of view. It's really that simple. So it's not really a lot to change. If you want to look at photography from the perspective of an artist, it's just really looking at it from a different point of view. And, and I think, um, I think if, if, if you can take some time and do that personal work, you know, I'm not suggesting you hop in and take that vow of poverty right off the bat, you know, cancel all your commercial work. But by the way, you know, I don't know if I mentioned this, but uh, I don't, I haven't done commercial work in a very long time. I refuse to accept any commercial work. I only do this. And, and luckily, once again, because I've been doing it so long, I, I have a huge um, body of work that, that I have access to sell. And I, you know, I used to fly around and teach workshops and, and give lectures. So we'll have to see how that goes in the next couple of years. But um, so you can you can take that vow of poverty and go totally into the art side. But I think what's really important and what I'm trying to get across maybe in this presentation today is that I think it's really important that you do some of your work from the perspective of an artist, because that's really going to help you grow as a photographer more than you can possibly imagine. And it's so important. Um, so just a quick summary up to this point um you know we've talked about vowel poverty and intent in the creation process um the differences between the two and the measure of a good image um which i think is is interesting conversation and and always i think good to bring up over coffee whenever you have a group of photographers and and of, and of course this documenting versus creating but i think there's something way more important than any of these and and that's what i'm going to spend the rest of this presentation on because i think the thing that's really important as a as a photographer trying to look at the world from the perspective of an artist is you have to be uh kind of crossing this batshit crazy line and i think this is um it, it's kind of funny in a way but it's it's not funny uh, it's what I mean by a batshit crazy, and I don't mean like putting on a tinfoil hat and pushing a shopping cart full of garbage down the street, even though I'm pretty sure I seen Rick do that last time I was in Hawaii. Um, it, I don't think that's the batshit crazy I'm talking about. What I'm really talking about is is and not just thinking outside the box, but forgetting there's a box altogether. Just forgetting any rules, doing stuff that's for you and about you. And, and I think that's what's really, really the focus when I talk about batshit crazy is to, to not worry about anything, just go out and do it. And, and for me, um, for example, I, I have this dogma and this is, this is nobody else's, but I refuse to do things in, in post-production. If I can't get it in camera, then I won't accept the image. And one of the reasons I do this, by the way, is because it forces intent. Every decision that's made is now made on the day while I'm creating the image. So it's so important to me that that it's done um, it's done in camera. But images like this one or this one are actually impossible um, in, in, without without um, without the trick I'm going to show you. These two images are literally impossible, other than in post production. But for example, a dancer could never do this without killing herself. And there's no way that this this wonderful um, actually she's a gymnast and a dancer could have did did the shot until you think about something like bolting the chair or the ladder to a wall. So if you if you tilt your head the right way and you so basically just doing simple things like saying oh what if I bolted the ladder to the to the wall and then I have this this gymnast just use a trampoline then all of a sudden I have this ability to get something pretty huge. So this is a small little tiny batshit crazy zone. Other things that I love to do is to work with cloth and motion. And 
And for example, if, I don't know if you can notice or not, but you can see this face and this cloth, which is really important. And maybe uh, maybe another one is is this, I don't know if you can see it, but it's this banshee. It's this kind of ghostly figure. And, and this was created um, by, well, you know, my assistant throwing this cloth for hours, literally hours. And, and, and I have to admit that maybe the batshit crazy and, and on these images is, is my assistants because they will just continue to do this and the models that I work with. And because I usually am just sitting on an Apple box way back by my camera, just saying, oh, no, let's do it again. No, let's do it again for literally hours. Uh, so I'm, I'm, really, I'm really quite lazy. Like I said, I don't even like being cold or hot or you know having a breeze. All this stuff, I'm very comfortable photographer. I like to, you know, not exert too much energy, so I sit back. So maybe I should be saying I'm not that batshit crazy, but the people I work with are batshit crazy. But this image, for example, was created after a couple of hours of throwing this cloth over and over and over again until something happened that was really quite spectacular. So maybe the batshit crazy part is the persistence to say, look, we're not going to get this unless we really work hard at it. And I think that's really important. Um, and for example, there's a series I did called cloud busting and it, it did push batshit crazy a little further than that. So we are working with powder and uh, in order to do this, there's a quite a few safety concerns that you have to do because um, a lot of powders can ignite if, if there's an open source of flame. Um, so, and one thing we had to do was coat the studio in plastic. So we used painter's plastic and, and basically made this giant tube of plastic around this big studio so we could have this incredibly messy powder in it. And, and it took a lot of failures. And I think that's probably another part of batshit crazy is you have to be prepared to test and fail, test and fail, and don't give up, just keep, keep trying. But these images were created with the same kind of uh, same kind of approach that the cloth, that you just do things over and over and over again, and adjusting small little adjustments until things happen. And when you do this, there is the potential for something good. Most of the times there isn't. Most of the times are failures. But sometimes you create something that's really exceptional. Um, and I, I actually talk about this image in particular. Um, is that if, if I did do some Photoshop in this image, I used a really complex algorithm called rotate 90 degrees uh, clockwise, maybe. Anyway, this image is actually rotated. So picture that the model is, um, is uh, jumping on, from the ground. So this is actually a, a ballet dancer. She's exceptionally good at, at her jumps and she can repeat this move over and over and over again, which is really good, uh, really good for me. The powder, uh, this is probably maybe, uh, I don't know, a year into shooting this book. And the powder, when you, when you, um, when you um, hold it in your hand and throw it out of frame, one out of, say, every 30 times when it hits the body, it does this. It literally wraps around and it leaves this beautiful trail on its way in. But most of the other times when you throw that powder, just as soon as it leaves your hands, it just goes into this big mist. Or when it hits the body, it just is a big clump and it falls down. And to this day, I have no idea what the difference is. Um, um, so it's really, it's really important that I was able to just keep trying and keep trying. But in this case, the person throwing the powder was uh, the, the dancer's husband. And he had to climb a ladder in order to get the, the vantage point to throw it. And then the other problem is I have to capture this image. So I have to get it at exactly the right time. I know exactly what she's going to do the jump, but at, in this time, this is 2009 or something. And, and I'm using an old RZ67 uh, or RZ67 for, for my American friends. And, and, uh, in, and, so, and I'm using a phase one, I think at that time was maybe an H25 back. So when I push the button, it's not actually, the, that's not literally when the picture happens. It happens a millisecond later. So you have to really get used to anticipating the moment. And so during this, I think we did 178 takes to get this image. And each time you have to come down off the ladder, redo the powder, climb back up, the dancer would reset, do the jump. I'd, you know, it would work perfectly and I'd miss the shot. 
or he wouldn't he would do exactly the same thing but the powder wouldn't be right and so it, i think the level of batshit crazy has to be this um this very very um diligent approach to say no i know this will work if we can all just keep doing it and and i think what's uh what's i've evolved past this this barrier of batshit crazy to the point of even when I walk into the studio to do a shot now, I don't always expect to get a shot that day. And one of the first conversations I have, every, anytime I'm meeting any, anybody who wants to come in and assist with me and anybody who wants to come in and model for me, I let them know right off the bat that, look, you may came, come in today or whenever we schedule this shoot and we can spend three hours and we may not get an image. We may only get an idea. So you have to be prepared to do that. That's the kind of thing that I'm willing to do, that I, I need that from everybody I work with. And if, if people are saying, oh no, I wanted to come in and I was thinking we could get 15 images. It's like, yeah, okay, you know, I can't get 15 images in a month, let alone in a session. So um, it's, really, it's really kind of important that everybody on the team understands that. I think that's, uh, that's really important. And someone just commented, that's a great thing about doing with real stuff, and it is. But it's also part of being the, the, the artist. And for example, it's a really good, Point. And I'm sorry that I'm not paying much attention, by the way, to a lot of these questions because um, I'm, I'm uh, and I'm going to get around to them in a minute if there's any more. But but one of the important things is, can you imagine taking this approach if you were doing commercial work? You, you would never have a second job. I can just imagine an art director coming and saying, OK, we need to shoot, you know, we need to shoot these uh, 35 watches this week. And I'm going, OK, well, we should be able to get the first shot maybe by next Friday. I don't know when we're going to get the next one. I mean, you know, I I would be I'd be out in the sidewalk. There's no way that you could approach commercial photography this way. It's really it's really the perspective of an artist that you can you can do this. So I think that was a very good comment. Um, so the next thing uh, you know, that I was prepared, and I think people need to be prepared to do, is to really to to create exceptional environments. So I'm really lucky up until December of uh, last year, which we, we actually sold our studio. But up until then, I had this gigantic studio that I could come in and access every day. And and I was working on this project that started in, as an idea about 15 years before that, but it needed a pool. So we literally built this pool inside the studio. And, and I'm not going to go into many details about this, but it's a whole level of batshit crazy uh, trying to figure out how to deal with a pool inside your studio. But this series literally had the camera mounted uh, up high. It was at around 17 feet up in the air in this catwalk loft that we had pointing down into the surface of the pool. And so I would, be, I could shoot from up in this, in this area and, and, or I could actually shoot from down beside the pool. And you can see the tether line that's going up and, and talking to the camera. In fact, you can see one of my assistants there uh, with what we call the poking stick. This is what we use to manipulate the cloth in the water. But during this series, and, and I'm literally, this is the, we took three years to create this book called Obscuro. And, and I have to tell you the first two years, we probably threw out most of the images. That's how big the learning curve was. It was a gigantic experiment in a way. Now we didn't work every month. We worked for four to five months each year. And then we would take the pool down and put the studio back so we could rent the space out or do whatever we had to do to, uh, to earn revenue from it. But, but for five months a year, roughly for three years, I worked on this, this book. And, and, Finally, we were able to start to create some of these beautiful illusions. By the way, no post-production. This is all the camera way up in the air pointing down through the surface. And, and a great, great learning uh, experience and a, and a very steep learning curve of not only all the technical aspects, but also how you get people to sync, how do you communicate with people, how do you, you know, how do you keep people from freezing to death? And, and I was able to do some really wonderful, incredible um, illusions, but the level of batshit crazy became really interesting. And for example, in this, in this uh, shot here, you see a, a ballet dancer in point on this floor, but actually the floor is not a floor, it's the side of the pool, it's a fake floor that's put in the side of the pool. What's below her is the floor of the pool, excuse me, 
And the cloth, this cloth is in this beautiful motion. Well, that motion is put in, into play by someone or two people standing on the side of the pool with these sticks adjusting the cloth. And then as the cloth starts to sink and form, um, we wait and grab the shot. So a couple of things. Um, I, of course, the model can't hear me, so she has to come up and I have to say, oh, your wrist was wrong. You need to turn your chin a bit more. And because I mostly work with dancers, it was really good because they could go back down and redo, redo everything exactly the same, except maybe make that small change. But what's really interesting, for example, in this shot is that there's no way she could sink and, and take this pose without her feet floating up to the surface. So we decided to just bolt the point shoes to this fake floor, which meant she had to stay in the pool for like two and a half, three hours. She certainly was able to bring her head to the surface and breathe, of course, but this was the only way that we could do this. And um, I just see the the question was, did we did I light it from the surface? And in fact, there's a there's a window. Uh, let me see if I can go back. Uh, if you look. Uh, on this on the left hand side of this image there you can see one of the lights is shining through the side of the pool so the the pool itself had windows cut in it so we were actually lighting through the surface or th i mean through the water itself but what we did put in the pool was uh, the diffusion and flags and all kinds of reflectors and different things to manipulate the light but you are right about the surface one of the things that was a problem of the surface was ripples and, and for example, in this case, I didn't want any of these images to look like they were underwater. I wanted everything to look like it was just ethereal, timeless, weightless. And, and that became another challenge was how do I get rid of the ripples? And what we had to do was just wait for them to die down. So the model would actually go underwater and grab this pose. Sometimes there would be, you, you, you don't see them, there might be a weight that she's holding. And then when, you know, we give this 15 or 20 seconds at the surface finally settled, she lets go of the weight and just starts to float up and come into the post and we grab that one shot and we do it over and over again. And for example, this image here that you see was two days for us to get this image. And and so I think you, you have to have this level of batshit crazy in order to, to kind of come up with things that tell your story and create your vision. And that's why I don't mean tinfoil hat and shopping cart full of garbage, but I do mean you have to say, okay, what is it I need to do to overcome this challenge? And, and I mean, a really good example is, is Rick, Rick Noyle's series um, uh, that where he drags this giant golden elephant around. That's freaking batshit crazy. I mean, that's really crazy. I, I mean, that's absolutely nut bar and I just love him for it. I think that's fantastic. So, so here's this incredibly good commercial photographer that's, uh, that has this bit of personal work that he does that just pushes batshit crazy. And I think that's so important. And I think if you're talking to Rick, he'd probably tell you that it is important. It's really important to him that he does this. And, and I asked him just before this presentation that, oh, how is this project going? I said, well, you know, it's a, it hasn't, you know, we haven't done too much since COVID because it's a big team. It's a lot of work to drag this giant, you know, kind of full-sized elephant replica, uh, you know, around to different places. So, so to me, it's, it's really, really important. And, and maybe something that's even more important is, um, is that you have to, um, oh, let me go back, by the way. Uh, you can, uh, by, by the way, the, the question was uh, lighting above the water surface. For the first year of this series, we did actually light uh, through the water surface instead of through the side of the pool. And you can do that if the angle of incidence is, is uh, shallow enough and you got to make sure that the camera in this case was offset and you, we used a tilt shift um, in order that the light doesn't reflect back up into the camera. So it is possible to shoot through the surface of the water, um, but the problem becomes it, it's a lot more front light. And anybody, you know, who's ever, uh, you know, been to any of my lighting presentations, I, always, I have this saying that says front light bad backlight good so i don't use any front light everything i do is through side light or backlight so one of the problems with shooting through the surface of the water is most of the light that you know went through the surface 
became uh, very much front light. So it really didn't work out very well for me. Sorry, I thought I'd mention that just while I thought of it. So the, the other thing that I think that's really important is you need to work with people who are just as batshit crazy, or in this case, more batshit crazy. And, and I started a project about three or four years ago uh, working with aerialists, this group of absolutely insane people. I have never met a, a group of people that were more dedicated to their art ever in my entire life. Not painters, not photographers, no one is as crazy as this group of people. And if you get a chance to work with aerialists, you should. It's just amazing. But this is a group of people that literally uh, come to, to their work each day expecting and knowing there's pain involved. Like uh, I can't. I actually started photographing some of the um, some of the uh, the injuries that these dancers or these aerialists would come into my studio with, and I just was going. I would totally give this up. Like the first bruise like this that appeared on me, I'd be out of there. That's it. I'm done. And it just used to blow my mind how dedicated and amazing this group of people were. And maybe that doesn't quite seem obvious, but if you look how I work, I, for example, I don't capture anything. Every image that you, you'll, you've seen or you will see has meticulous, every single body language, every, every bit of light, even the hair, everything other than the random piece of flown cloth is put there by intent. So usually when people photograph aerialists or even dancers for the most part, they're literally documenting, which is not a bad thing, they're documenting their dance or they're documenting the aerialist performance. But that's not what I'm doing uh, uh, at all. Uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it's really important that you uh, put the intent in. And for me, it's all intent. So these aerialists are used to flowing through a performance, but I had to get them to do the same thing over and over again. And in many times, hold a pose or hold you know a, a, a moment that was really difficult in fact for example this shot I, to this day i don't even know how she does this but it took us a long time to get everything exactly right in this photograph and it just used to blow my mind how much dedication and control that these aerialists had um in fact this is one of my favorite images to talk about because it looks so it's it, it's it's based it's certainly based on a Caravaggio slash, it's kind of Caravaggio lighting, but very much based on Sistine Chapel, you know, kind of looking down, um, you know, very ethereal in a way. And the, the aerialist that's in the red silks, who looks so relaxed with her gentle hands up in the air looking down, well, she's in, in a lock that's actually really painful. So those, the, those lines under her arms, it's what's holding her entire body weight up. It's very difficult to do. And usually you wouldn't hold this for very long. So every time we did a shot, she'd have to come down, you know, kind of rub out the pain and go back up, get into this lock, do this pose with the changes I've made. Because I might say, oh, can you bring your hands a little closer together? Can you tilt your head? This I need you to look down. And then the other model that you see is actually jumping up and grabbing to her from a trampoline. So she's making this, and we can only do one or two of these at a time. And then of course, I'm doing the same thing with her. Oh, next time you jump, I need that knee to be just under, underneath this knee. You need to be looking down a certain way. I need to take the shot when your hair is actually blowing back, even though we did have a fan going to give the illusion that her hair was there. But if, if I caught the jump in the wrong place, it, it just it just didn't look right. So this is a pretty significant amount of batshit crazy. And without um, without the dedication from some of these airless, it'd be impossible, absolutely impossible. And and then I decided to take a, a step past batshit crazy in a way. There's a there's a lighting that I love, which is um, shooting directly into a giant uh, white softbox, basically. And in this case, I had to make a really big softbox. So this bit went into my entire studio, became this giant softbox. So technically, what you see here on the left-hand side is this giant 16 foot by 16 foot. Um, basically, it's three quarter or a little more than three quarter diffusion. And behind it, I think, are 12 or 14 strobe heads, all pointing towards 
um, giant rolls of white seamless. So there, it's this very soft light bouncing back into this giant scrim, if you wish, or this giant bit of diffusion. But uh, one thing I've noticed over the years is when you shoot uh, subjects, especially bodies, really close, meaning inches away from, from this type of light source, you get a really unique, incredibly beautiful light that gives great sculpture and definition. And but the problem is, you if you change the body even a little bit too much either way, it kind of ruins the whole effect. And because I'm working with aerialists, I'm not able to move the body. So we built this giant, uh, this giant softbox that we could actually move the softbox itself in and out of the model's uh, direction. So that that became once again a very technical thing. But for me, I was able to start to create some really beautiful illusions with this incredible light that I like to use. And, and I think, um, to me, it was a really important uh, element in the book. And especially because this was meant to be a book. So, so uh, Ariel is a book that, that has half the book is this kind of dark images and half the book is this white images. And I wanted to take the viewer on this journey. So I really had to figure this, this whole process out. Um, and but once again, talk about batshit crazy. There's you know there's some some aerialists like this one that that I, I remember uh, I, I I had seen an aerialist in the UK do this scapula hang. She's literally hanging off of her shoulder blades. And I remember that there's a guy I'm going to show you an image coming up. I, I showed him the image. I said I'd love to do something that looked like you were flying and almost in a prayer uh, in this. And he, and he just went that's there's no way. He said I'm pretty strong, but he said I can't do this. And ironically enough, uh, you know, this 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 aerialist came in the next day and said, "Oh, I, I can do this." And and of course, every time he came in to a model for me after that, I was I always had this image up on my screen just to you know just to rub it in a bit. But um, but there's there's was a beautiful opportunities to create immensely unique and interesting and very subtle metaphors with this light form that I couldn't have got with that kind of Caravaggio lighting. So it was really important to me that I was able to push this on. And I'm going to show um, so an image in a minute, but I think the one thing that was important to almost if you look at any image I've created was that I was able to create an environment that allowed me to fail. And, and I can't stress how important this is. So you know the, uh, everything I've talked about, right from intent and 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 uh, you know vowel poverty and your approach and all this stuff, really talks about having having the ability to say it's okay to come in and fail. I'm doing this for me. I'm creating this image. This is a story I want to tell. I haven't got it figured out. I'm going to just keep trying. And and I have to admit, for example, the you know taking three years to shoot Obscuro with this underwater stuff wouldn't have happened if I was just had access to a rented pool, you know, maybe five times. There's no way I could have figured all this stuff out. Working with these aerialists, I looked, some of these aerialists came in every day for weeks while we worked out how to do things, how to, how to get, you know, get the locks. So they, and I'm sorry, a lock is when you wrap a silk around. Usually the locks are really ugly because they're trying not to fall. And for me, of course, I wanted beautiful, gentle lines. So we had to figure out ways to make it safe, but to have these lines. So having a place to fail became really important. And, and for example, this is a really interesting behind the scenes image of me capturing this image here. And, and, I, and I think probably this image sums up the level of batshit crazy. When this guy came in and he, we were doing this shot where you see him and, and, I, I, and it started off saying, I'd like to do something that was kind of based roughly on the Da Vinci man, but but you've fallen through the hoop in a way. And I said, it's too bad we can't get someone hanging off one of your arms. And he said, well, I can't do that. That's crazy. But he said, I can get someone hanging off my feet. And I said, no, that's crazy. And sure enough, he could. And so his, his aerialist partner uh, was has this beautiful dance line. And, and and she said, yeah, he can he can actually hold me off of his feet. But the problem is he can only do it for maybe 10 times. And I thought, well, 10 times is just not enough for me to capture an image. It's not enough for me to create this because I'm going to, holy smokes, I'm going to be making so many changes. Um, so we, we, we basically had to shoot this for four days. And so on the fourth day, uh, we were able to grab this image. And, and luckily, I actually was running some behind the scenes footage on that day. And this is kind of the process that you see. He's up. 
She climbs up into his feet. I have this assistant that's literally spinning the body around just to the exact right. You know, I grab the shot. I, I have maybe 15, 10 or 15 seconds before he can't do this for very long, but at least I'm able to, I'm able to give each one directions on lower your right arm, move your right arm, you know, and kind of just screaming out how to, what changes one made. She, her, the assistant runs out of frame. We grab the shot. And then what you see beneath, beneath uh, the, 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 the female um, aerialist is, is this giant 12-inch uh, crash mat. So she literally falls into this crash mat, and he comes down. And these people were crazy enough to come in for four different sessions in order to get this shot. And the irony is, for them to get this shot was worth everything because this is also kind of the pinnacle of their art form. This is them being represented in a way that they've never been represented in. For them, it was the most amazing thing ever. So I think that was really important. And, and for me, it's really about having this place that you can come in and fail. So I, I'm gonna spend a, a little more time, hopefully I haven't, I haven't bored everybody to death, but I, I wanna talk a little about this next project, the one I'm working on right now, which has taken everything I've done so far, all that level of batshit crazy, and just give it a, a little push over the edge. And, and I think it's a, a philosophy I'd like to share, and I'm gonna, I've am gonna got a little behind the scenes video that I'd like to play in a minute, but I, I think what's really, really been interesting is um, to take everything I've learned and then to apply it one more step further. So, what I'm going to show you is a series that's called Myth. And it, ironically enough, we were we initially planned on having this book available by December. And of course, this thing called COVID has changed all of our lives, uh, everyone on the planet. And so we think it might be released in 2021. It might be 2022. I have no idea. But it's based around uh, one of my favorite topics. And, and this is the Greek myths. And for me, Greek mythology is not new. In fact, if you look at most of the Renaissance paintings, there's so much that's been inspired by Greek mythology. But so, but I, but I, I've always found Greek mythology certainly, you know, pretty heavily misogynistic, heavily male dominant, and 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 also, it's. I just wanted to bring it into a more modern modern metaphor. But uh, but I love the aesthetic of the 1870s. I love the whole look of kind of the mid 1800s London. And, and I thought, well, I'm gonna create a series that, that has all, or not all, but a great deal of the Greek myths retold with current you know, 20, you know, 2020 metaphors, but I'm gonna set it in 1800s and, and in London. So, um, I, and, but you gotta remember, I, I wasn't gonna be able to do this by renting uh, you know, an Airbnb that's built in an 1800s building I needed to be able to go in and spend months and months and months, and in this case, maybe years, to create some of these images. So I need an environment I could create in. So what I what I did was, in my studio, we basically just started building sets. And these sets are just like you would see on a production stage, in a film, or a theater stage. They're, they're fake, everything is fake, um, you know, they're just uh, film flats, as we call them, or stage flats. They're four feet by eight foot panels, and and you know, there's basically painting and and fake panels. And I'm really lucky uh, that my wife is a is an incredibly good set decorator and designer, and she also didn't charge me for any of this, so it was even better. Um, so I could get her to design these sets, paint these sets, and really, it was a huge advantage to have. Once again, to be married to someone who's also a batshit crazy, that's a great advantage. So we ended up building some of these big, wonderful, beautiful sets that I could go in and start to tell these stories. And, and if you'll bear with me, I'm gonna tell a few. I'm gonna talk a, a few, but I think this will this will give you hopefully a bit of inspiration of what happens when you push one step past that batshit crazy. Um, and you know, once again, I'm. I, you know, I'm without question, I have a big studio or had a big studio, big sets, lots of lighting gear. You know, I've got a fair amount of experience in lighting, so I understand lighting fairly well. And and so for me, I was able to to get through the lighting parts of this fairly, fairly easy. 
And, um, but I was also able to spend a lot of time failing. And you also have to remember, I don't do any post-production. So I, I could spend a couple of days getting a set lit and you'll, you'll, and, and, and then have the models or models come in and, and, and then work just on getting the shot. And sometimes it, that took days, but it was also this process. So the behind the scenes uh, video I'm going to show you are for, is for this next image, but I, I want to give you an idea of the, the, the series. And for example, this is maybe the darkest image in the book as far as its metaphor, but this is, and it may be hard to see in your screens and I apologize for this, but this is a story about Medusa. And it's really interesting. I had not really thought about doing uh, a Greek myth, you know, image with Medusa because I always thought of Medusa as this kind of hideous monster that turned people to stone. And in fact, when I was in uh, the Fusi Gallery in, 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 uh, in Florence, there's this the shield painted uh, by by Caravaggio, which has Medusa, this hideous monster, severed head, by the way. And it's a really kind of, ooh, this is a crazy, crazy monster Medusa. And I never thought about it anymore until I started reading about it. And, and I was so shocked that I really didn't understand the myth. And by the way, there's many versions of this, but the one I'm choosing, and this is the luxury about uh, using Greek myths is there's it's not like well it's not you're not telling the true story it's like well look they're they're myths and you can pick the one that makes sense and I so I picked the one I wanted to say something about and in this myth this is about Medusa the woman so Medusa is one of three sisters originally and and she was basically um, a priestess at the temple of Athena she's beautiful woman she's at the temple of Athena and and if anybody knows anything about Athena, it's, there's rules are really important for Athena. And one day, Poseidon, the god of the oceans, is coming by for whatever reason and notices Medusa, and feels he must have her. And most of the stories that I follow for this talks about how he comes in and rapes Medusa in uh, Athena's temple. And when Athena hears about this, of course, she's outraged. So what does she do? She turns Medusa into this creature. She doesn't punish Poseidon. And I find, of course, that's friggin' batshit crazy. But it's also punish the victim scenario that's not unheard of. In fact, it still goes on today in different parts of the world. And it's just, it's unbelievably sad and, and hideous. That's the monster. And so for me, I wanted to tell the story uh, a different way. And so I, I had this idea to create this parlor, this 1800s parlor that had all the mirrors covered up. So this is a, a place where Medusa, um, Medusa lives now and all the mirrors in her house are covered. But one day she's walking by and one of the mirrors is uncovered. And she notices for the first time that she's this beautiful girl. And I thought that's quite wonderful. This is for the first time Medusa saying, this was not my fault. This is not about me. This was nothing I did. And, and I thought it was a beautiful moment and I wanted to capture it this way. And then I wanted to do a second image. And this is the one I have the behind the scenes video that was a little more lighter, a little more, um, uh, you know, basically more in character of the book. Cause most of the book is really making, taking, taking the piss out of a lot of the Greek myths and, and kind of giving them an interesting twist. Um, so this is Medusa later on sometime, you know, totally comfortable with herself now, admiring herself in the mirror. In fact, you even see a snake in, in the set here. And this is really, um, really funny because in the background, you see this pile of rubble that could be marble. And as you know, Medusa, if she could, if, if you stared at her, you were turned to stone. And I, and in this pile of rubble is this trident, which, you know, is a metaphor. Could it, it maybe it's Poseidon or one of Poseidon's offsprings. Anyway, this was just a little bit of revenge. And I thought it was quite, quite a, you know, a little bit lighter image to follow the one that was certainly more, uh, more um, dark. So um, what I'm gonna do, if, if you want, this is a five minute uh, video and it has me talking, but it's pre-recorded. I did this a while ago. And uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to uh, play this video and I think it's five minutes and 14 seconds and I will join you again as soon as this is over. There's really two main locations in the set. There's the foreground, which has Medusa looking in the mirror and it has a couple of 
um, significant lighting challenges because we need to see her face in the mirror. Um, the lighting, just even in the, the secondary room, the back room, is uh, created with, with a couple of strobes. One's directly overhead, that's a gridded softbox that's pointing down onto the, the rubble itself and the trident. And there's a pretty significant uh, flagging going on just to have the light where I want it. The overall room itself, the back room, you know, with the covered mirror and the and the and the and the, the hutch or whatever you want to call it, that piece of furniture, is lit side on by a pretty big softbox. So it's it's and it's feathered lit. So there's kind of this gradient light. And the main part of the set has a couple of lights. It, you know, it has, um, you know, the, the light that's really interesting that's lighting Medusa's face because we only see her face in the mirror is a, is a, is a spot that's coming in and, and really directed only at her face. And the rest of the light is by soft sources off all side lit. And we also, uh, or I decided that I would also kind of put an ambient fill light in. So one of the soft boxes that's further on back is just there to make sure that the black levels aren't too black. So, so that where there's always a bit of light in the room somewhere. And, um, and that's really the whole set for this thing. It's, it's, it's me putting all these lights in and then testing each one, usually one at a time, seeing where the contribution of light goes and then creating this balance. And most times I use, uh, you know, this 1920s dress form we call Agnes as a stand-in, and we put Agnes, Agnes in the set, and, and, and you know, I, I, usually she's got gray cards taped all over her. Um, I normally have what I call my focus stick or my focus devometer, this yardstick that's on an angle, and, and that was placed to, to get the very accurate, accurate focus marks so I know exactly where all my focus, um, focus attention is, is placed. Um, and, and this process is not any different from any of the other videos I've, I've done before, that if you've seen them, you can see that this process is exactly the same. It's just methodical, slow, one bite at a time. I keep tuning the image until it's quite perfect, until it's really exactly what I need it to be. And what's really fun and interesting about this shoot for me was this is the first time I had worked with a live snake on set. And, and this is, was a you know, funny, interesting, uh, scary at times thing for me. And the only reason I wanted a snake in set, I just wanted a snake off to the side, integrated into the, into the frame, that really reinforced this comfort by Medusa of who she is. This process of creating the Medusa shot um, was was really interesting normally anyway, even without a snake, just by the whole process. And as you can see, the process doesn't change very much for me. You know, we, we get the model set up, we try to find the lines, we try to find the shape, and then we lock it in and we just make minor, tiny little adjustments to hands, legs, gesture, until the story starts to really come together. And in this case, Putting the snake in the set was funny because it, it added, like in my previous images, it added like powder or cloth. It added some level of, of you know, something we couldn't predict. The, the snake was going to do what the snake was going to do, and, and as good as Kelly was as a, as a snake wrangler, you know, she would, she would try to coax her snake into being where we wanted it. It really wasn't going to go to where we wanted it unless it wanted to. So, um, and, you know, and, I, and I'm very thankful to have uh, Kelly, who's, a, who's the snake's owner and also, you know, very comfortable with wrangling reptiles. So she's very good at her job and she made sure that the snake was safe and that her model was safe and that, you know, that, that the environment was comfortable for everybody. So uh, I think if you're going to work with live animals, you, you, you have to hire and have professionals on set to make sure that everybody's safe, including the animal. And, and uh, so that was, at least that wasn't a worry for me that day that, you know, uh, and I even, I even did touch a snake, which is rare for me because I'm not really a big touch animal fan other than maybe kittens or puppies. But um, so it was a really great experience for me to get to work a bit out of my comfort zone. And, uh, and, and at the end of the day, I'm really quite happy with the final image from it. This, including the very first one, are two wonderful images uh, that become part of this new series and I'm quite happy to share them with you in this video series. There, uh, that gives you at least a, a tiny look
at the, the, my process of creating an image. And, and, and I think it probably fits in the batshit crazy range. Um, and, and the irony is, uh, and, and on the, 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 uh, the video itself, by the way, I, I, it used to be like 15 minutes long and I cut it up to make, to fit into this, this presentation today. And I'm just gonna go over a couple of more images that, that just to show you, someone asked earlier on about the, the process of, of, of uh, the ideas. And, 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 I'll, and I'm gonna, this is, this is what I call wrong arrows. And, and it's based on um, uh, the, mythic, the mythology of um, Eros. And Eros, or if you're familiar with the Roman, this would be Cupid. And of course, uh, in my world, Eros or Cupid is female, not male, and and um, and so basically, if you think about it, Cupid is this um, this this god that goes around uh, and shoots people with these arrows and makes them fall in love. Uh, that's kind of the lighter, you know, kind of uh, you know the card, basically, you know the 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 you know the the, the I love you card version of of Cupid or Eros. And, and there's a part of the story, which I'll show you uh, a couple images, where Eros um, falls in love with this mortal called Psyche. And in fact, they, they kind of split up. Anyway, it's a long story. I'm just going to call it that. They split up and Eros, in my world, gets just crazy. She, she starts to just drink every day and, and, and does laudanum and, and is just totally lost it. And, and I, it, one, of, one of these days, an idea just popped in my head. I was working with this model that was uh, that was playing Eros, and I just thought, what if one day you, you picked the wrong Eros? Wouldn't that be funny? What if one day Eros just gets up, hungover, and picks the wrong Eros? So in this image, you see Eros in the foreground, looking a bit confused at this real hunting arrow, and in the background, you see this couple with this woman. Uh, her mentor is now slumped over dead with an arrow sticking out of his back. And I just thought that's, I, I know it's, and this is maybe a little dark, but it's kind of funny in a way, what happens if Eros chose the wrong arrows? And, and that's really how this idea came, was how, you know, how, how funny would that be? The difficult part became, how do we craft this image? Where are the elements? How do I make it so the first place you look is Eros's face and that, if you spend enough time, you start to drink the rest of the image in. So what's in focus, what's not in focus, what's lit really well, what's not lit really well. Of course, the 1870s style, so the clothing design had to be done right. The wings themselves were brutally hard to place, uh, and so they didn't move. And then once again, all my dogmas on body line had to apply to all the models. So even the hand gesture from the models in behind and even the hand gesture from the, the guy who's playing the, the dead, the dead suitor, you know, all of this was with intent. Every single thing was with intent. So I just thought it was interesting. I'm going to, because I'm going to run out of time, I'm going to just do a couple of images. And this is, this is, by the way, Eros once again, and Eros is, um, is sleeping. And this is a story of Psyche in Eros. And, and I think it's a really interesting story. And this particular uh, story has been told many times from painters. And basically, this is Psyche, who uh, has been basically, in a way, abducted by Eros, and Eros won't uh, show in, in myth himself to her, in my case, herself to her. And this is her sister has told Psyche that this must be some monster, and you should sneak in in the middle of the night and stab, stab him to death, or her to death in this case. And this is the moment that Psyche reveals uh, Eros not to be this monster, but to be this beautiful um, this beautiful uh, suitor. And, and ironically, what's really difficult, even though this idea wasn't very original, I, I, this, is, this has been done many times, but I wanted to do it with, once again, a female Eros, but what was really difficult was lighting this set so the candles looked real. What was really difficult was having this poor model propped up holding this candelabra and me going, no, you got to tilt it a little more this way and a little more this way. But what you don't see is that the only thing that's touching is her knee that's behind her leg. Everything else is just floating. So, so it becomes this level of crazy, crazy um, dedication to creating the image that I need from everybody involved. 
Um, this, this is a, a very interesting technical question. This is Danae, who has been locked in a tower um, because her father said, uh, her father went to see this oracle. Um, and the oracle said, your daughter is going to have a baby, and that baby is going to grow up and kill you. So what does any good father do? He locks her into a tower, which, once again, totally batshit crazy. So this, this scene's been done hundreds and hundreds of times in painting. This is basically what happens is one night, Zeus is flying over, as Zeus does, and looks down and sees her, and comes down in golden rain and seduces her. And I wanted to put, put this the other way around. I wanted this to be Danae trying to get back at her father for imprisoning her. And she's looking up and she sees Zeus and she seduces him. In my case, I didn't want to use golden rain, so we used golden smoke. And one of the crazy things about this, this is done in camera. So if we have time later, I'll talk about how this was done. But this was done in camera, one shot. And what I did was use very long exposures with a pitch dark uh, studio and the light lighting the smoke is a is on a different channel than the light lighting the rest of the set so we would shoot the image with with the model she wouldn't move we would cover the camera's lens with a piece of cardboard turn on one quick light my assistant would put some smoke in the set and then shut that light back off pull the camera off pull the, the uh, cardboard off the front of the camera and then trigger the second strobe which is only lighting the smoke and that's how I was able to get this. By the way, you might enjoy the next image. So even though I wanted to have uh, Danea being in, in charge, I thought I would also make it a little bit funnier. What happened if, if Zeus wasn't really able to perform? So uh, it didn't really work out so well anyway for anybody. And, and in my case, because the book is continuous, I, if, if, you, if anybody knows Greek mythology, the sun that, that, that uh, Danea has is Perseus, and Perseus goes on to kill Medusa. And in my world, nobody kills Medusa. So I, I thought this was kind of fun that it did, things didn't work out very well. Um, I'm gonna skip by this, and I'm gonna talk about uh, 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 something that's really important. And it's the nine muses, and I think this is maybe if I've got a point from, from this whole thing is, for me, the, the muses, uh, a great deal of the muses were written about by the, the, the I think it's 400 or 500 BC, the poet Hesiod. And he talks about the Muses as being this group of gods, if you wish, that were put here to inspire us as artists, inspire dancers and poets, and, and they were here to inspire us. And, and I, I thought, that not that wonderful that, yeah, these nine Muses came down and they inspired you know, Michelangelo and, and Mozart and all these incredible artists. And I thought, how weird is it that now, what's what used to be important was the art that you created but what seems to have taken over especially since social media isn't what you create it's just being known for creating it and i think that's uh, you know i know that's a little bit of an old man standing up on a soapbox saying get off my lawn but i i think it's one thing i you know i really like to say is m many people are really talking about um of you know creating stuff but that doesn't seem to be as important as the number of likes you get or the number of followers you have on whatever platform that seems to be what's more important so in my world the nine muses are no longer required everybody everybody's not worried about what they create they're just worried about being known for creating something so the nine muses are now basically unwanted and in my world they're going crazy so Cleo, the, the muse of history is starting to just tattoo history on herself. And, and in my world, the, the, the muse of uh, love poetry, Arado, can't write. No one wants to hear what she has to say. And the muses are all now kind of drug addicted, drunken, fallen over, you know, that nobody wants them. And, and I think this is really an interesting uh, approach to the, to the muses. And in fact, I'm going to show one more shot before I, I'm going to open up a few more questions. And, and I'm going to talk about this image, this beautiful image that I've, uh, I, I was able to, uh, that Rick sent me a hundred and some images and I picked out and I'd like to talk about that. But so this is a bar scene that we built and, and I apologize for the bad image. It's just a screen grab. But I wanted to create a shot of all nine muses. So this next shot is what I call the nine muses fight club. And this was all done in camera, of course, because uh, it has to be for me. 
And this took three weeks to light, and it took each one of these positions, this is all done at one time, but the testing for it was done over three different sessions. So I would bring two models in and I would you know, put them in each place and basically get an idea of what I wanted. But the image itself had to be done in one shot. So this for me is kind of the, the this is the, in the book, it's the end of the story of the Muses, but this is kind of the nine Muses fight club. And it, and it goes on and on and on. And uh, uh, it's one of my favorite images that we've created so far. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I know I've drawn on really long. We only have nine minutes left. But before so, and I don't know, Rick, if you're listening, if, if, you want to, um, if you want to put the image up, the one I selected. Uh, oh, uh, so I'm going to answer uh, what minimal post processing do you, I, I, I use raw. I always shoot raw. I recommend shooting raw if you can. Um, that's that's basically uh, the the best the best suggestion. Um, uh, who who my customers typically are? Uh, my customer my my collectors, people who collect my art. And it's a, that's a long journey, by the way. That's uh, that's uh, people who collect your art is something you build up over years and years and years. So I have this group of people that buy buy the art. Um, uh, very cool raw photos, like no embellishments, none. So, for example, the only thing I'll do in post production is if uh, so shadows dodge and burn and blemishes because I can't control blemishes and but you've seen for example in my video I show cleaning the floor with a broom I find it really funny so many people say oh yeah you can get that in post it's like yeah or I can get it right now I can you know I can paint that spot that's on the wall or I can I can get rid of the like the dust off the floor with the broom you know like I, I do it when I can so I to be honest if I had to spend two minutes doing Photoshop I think I'd kill myself like I mean I just despise doing post-production. So it's, I don't think it's wrong. It's just I I just don't want to do it. Um, I appreciate your assistance, but the, it's, where do you conceive these from? I have no idea. Uh, actually, I have an idea. So here's, there's. I'm going to mention this. I don't know if you want to write this down somewhere or whoever's moderating this. There's a TED Talk um, by um, the woman who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. Uh, it's not coming to my mind uh, if anybody knows it. Uh, and it's a TED talk about creativity. Uh, I think you should, everybody should watch it. It's an amazing TED talk. So the author of Eat, Pray, Love, can't believe I can't think of her name. This happens every time. But this TED talk talks about creativity and about how it just comes to you if you let it. And so, for example, I think a really important answer to your question is where, where does it come from? Is, is having a place to go fail and being open to the idea, basically working with people that um, um, is, is uh, uh, are on the same wavelength as you, that will come in and, and are okay with you not getting an image that day. They're okay to test and fail. That's really, really important. And, and I think that when you do that, the ideas actually pop into your head. So it's quite amazing. Um, Good, good photography. Yes, I agree, hundred percent. Emotional impact is is everything for me. It's it's the measure. Um, it, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> with all the books behind you, which one do you say? Well, I'll buy it. Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, you could. I, I buy all three of the ones I have at the moment. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, it's it's uh, Elizabeth Gilbert. Thank you very much, Elizabeth Gilbert. Is so if you just Google TED Talk Elizabeth Gilbert. It's worth the 15 or 20 minutes without question. Um, by the way, just really quick, uh, if, um, if you want, uh, please go to my website. And if you want to just join my mailing list, there's a contact page. Just say, yes, join my mailing list. And, and I'm happy to give you any updates. And you can ask, continue to ask me questions there. It might take me a little while to get back to you on them, but I'm happy to do so. Um, so artists typically do not throw their workouts <laughs> oh no my work's thrown out in fact one of my favorite things to do when i'm shooting i shoot to uh to a screen i delete as we go i usually only keep one or two images during a shoot uh that's it i'm brutal at getting if my work if the image to me isn't doesn't meet the the bar i kill it it's gone no question um what other photographers or artists are your strongest inspirations? Uh, 
Caravaggio for light, uh, the Pre-Raphaelites for story, because they once again they they pick on a lot of um, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, themes that I love. But uh, guys like Frederick Frederick uh, you know Frederick Watts or um, that I showed you Hope, um, William Waterhouse uh, and and Herbert Draper are three amazing painters that I that I really I really steal a lot of stuff from. In fact, 99% of my inspiration comes from painters, not from photographers. I know that's kind of weird, but that's really where most of my inspiration comes from. Yeah. Uh, can you a chance to use a fraction of your workflow on paper? Absolutely. In fact, where you can use this. So everything I've talked about today is really about creativity, giving your, your own voice to work, making your brain think of things. This is really important in commercial work. In fact, uh, when I was doing commercial in my in my in my front office and in my studio, I never put commercial work up on the walls. I only put fine up work on the walls. And I tell you, clients would walk in and go, "That's not what we're looking for." But this is the brain we're looking for. We want this. We want we want you to be able to create for us in our you know commercial world something as creative as this. So that's really important. Like, and I think a lot of people forget this. So if you're just gonna show, and if you're just gonna you know, follow the recipes, oh, I use butterfly lighting or whatever recipe you want, and you're gonna create images that everybody else is creating, you're, you're gonna end up in this race to the bottom thing. You're, you're gonna end up you know, pricing yourself out of business. So when the, the only differentiator between you and somebody else is price, you're gonna lose, because that's a terrible differentiator when it comes to business. You have to have some creative edge and something that's really unique. And, and I think this is a great approach is to start to put some art back into this. Um, so, uh, Rick, are you going to, ah, there we go. I got so, I'm sorry I ran, I'm, I'm rambling. I didn't, didn't know I'd be on this long, but um, so, Rick, if you can give me that image, I'll show well, people all, the one I chose. But, but first of all, I got to tell you, you're awesome, um, inspiring, um, fantastic, and um, you know, you've got what we all want. You, 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 you have something, Steve, that I think every creative wants, where you can get the inspiration from inside, find things that you are looking at that you admire and then go about it and take tedious amount of time to create. Just uh, your imagery was fantastic. And uh, Steve, your presentation was wonderful. Thank you. I, I, I personally was very inspired. And the fact that I'm gonna be here for the day and tomorrow, I'll be itching to get out and take my elephant out and get a shooting again. I can't, I can't wait, and I hope you send me the newest image. Yes, <laughs> I will. Yes. <laughs> um, Steve, that, that, thank you so much. And the fact that you, you share so uh, with great detail, all of your details, um, I think that's what we are all looking for. Photocon Hawaii Virtual is that. I, I see this as a way that we creatives in Hawaii can be inspired by somebody like yourself and the other speakers and it's a wonderful thing. So, you know, if COVID has done anything, it's brought us together in this way, and uh, we really appreciate it. Let's go to the image that you selected. And um, okay. th this is just an amazing image. Um, the photographer's name is Brandon Kawamura. Brandon, I hope you're online. I don't know whether you are, but congratulations. Uh, Steve, what do you think? Well, so it's really, so the criteria for this image was actually, Rick, I, you, you probably know it by heart, but the essence of the pandemic in Hawaii. Right. And so this was the intent of the image was that was the story. And, and I have to admit there was, this was also, and I don't want to say this as, oh, this is the stock answer. There were some really great images there. It was always hard to judge any of them, but that, that there were some really great images, but I can tell you, this one for me came out and hit me like a brick in the forehead. This, I put my own feelings on top of this image. Mm -hmm. This is the essence of the pandemic, of, of this barrenness, this emptiness, this feeling behind this cage. It, it, this meant so much to me when I looked at it. I just went, oh, this, this is exactly how I feel. And, and all of a sudden, my own experiences were layered on top of this image. And to me, that is 
outrageously important when it comes to art. So this was this was like, I'm sorry, there, I, there's no question. This is my choice. Fantastic. Without, so I, I can't tell you whether it follows rules of fit. Well, I can't tell you. But I mean, I can, it doesn't matter whether this has, someone might say, oh, well, the exposure and this, the highlights are black. Like, who, none of that's yeah. worth anything. Zero, not an inch. Yeah. This is beautiful yeah. image. So congratulations to the to the artist who created yeah. it. It's, it's quite Exceptional. Yeah, Brandon, you've won a uh, Capture One Pro 20, uh, which is a magnificent uh, software program that uh, both Steve and I yep. use. Um, I, I know you will enjoy that. So we want to thank uh, Phase One and Capture One for uh, lots of things, but for supporting Photocon Hawaii Virtual and having Steve uh, Rashad come and, and be with us in our living room, which is kind of a nice feeling um, to be able to enjoy today. Uh, folks, uh, just a quick reminder, We've got five more fantastic workshops today. Um, please, you can go right now. You can go and register. Again, it's all free. Um, sign up, kick back, uh, take some time out, and, and be inspired by our great speakers. Steve, I want to thank you from all of us in Hawaii for being with us. Um, your presentation was spectacular, and we really appreciated you being here with us. Thank you. Always a pleasure. And and once again, to everybody out there, feel free to drop me a line. You might have to get through a bit of a wall on my site and answer a code or something. But And I, I answer all email, even though it takes me a couple of days. But I'm happy to uh, to talk to anybody. Okay, well, you're great. So, uh, thank you, and aloha from Hawaii. You you as well, Rick. Aloha from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Okay, thanks to everybody. And I look forward to the elephant. Th thanks, yep. and I want to thank everybody who signed on. We've just got people from all over the world and I cannot tell you, um, after we've worked hard to bring these days to you, seeing everybody coming from all over the world is heartwarming. Thank you, everybody. Bye.